Welcome back. I get a lot of my material simply by looking on the web, uh, looking at the uh, various blogs, to see what people are asking. Uh, one of the most popular questions is from people who have uh, got a handgun or just purchased a new handgun. Uh, perhaps it's a new caliber they've never used before. Um, and they want to know what the best load is for it. Well, of course, if somebody asks that question online, they're going to they're gonna be filled up with uh, more answers than they can possibly handle from people all over the world recommending their favorite loads, their favorite primers, their favorite powders, bullets, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, as things go, uh, some of those loads can be absolutely lousy. Some of them can be fantastic. Uh, some of them can be actually unsafe. But no matter what they are, the person is still left with the same quandary that he had when he started out. Uh, he or she simply has no clue what it is that uh, anybody is, uh, you know, whether they're, whether they're giving a qualified answer or if it's completely uh, bogus. And you know, <clears throat> the way things go with, with the internet, you don't even know the authenticity of the person on the other end. You don't know, for instance, if they even know what they're talking about. You don't know if they've ever touched a loading die or even a gun in their life. You know, it could be just somebody who likes to sit in an armchair, uh, who hasn't got any interest in, in shooting, and who's just simply prattling off uh, information that uh, you know he's seen already written by somebody else. So uh, these are all these are all things that um, everybody has to keep in mind. I can help you with uh, getting the very best load for your handgun. Now, let me qualify that by saying that there is no such thing as a very best load for handguns. Because if there were such a thing. Uh, you wouldn't need to have you wouldn't need to have a loading manual with this many pages in it by any means. You'd just simply have you'd have a list of calibers and you'd have a list of all the very best powders and a list of all the very best loads, and that'd be the end of it. <clears throat> well, things aren't that simple, and yet uh, because they're not that simple, it actually makes the selection far easier. The, there are a host of extremely good loads uh, for handguns and rifles and shotguns. There is a host of them. Uh, it's, it's an endless combination of extremely good possibilities. The best way to determine uh, what the best load is for you is to just simply uh, to just simply test a series. How you arrive at a particular test series is pretty simple. You determine first of all what category of load you're going to be uh, shooting. For instance, now this is my this is my Ruger Red Hawk. I'm going to be loading up some uh, test loads for you. Uh, we're going to do that here, and then we're going to take them out to the we're going to take them out uh, to the outdoors, and we're going to test those and do an actual load assessment. So this Ruger Red Hawk is a 44 Magnum, and because it's a 44 Magnum, it can also handle the 44 Special, the classic old 44 Special from which the 44 Magnum uh, came, was uh, simply a 44 Special uh, lengthened by a tenth of an inch and it became the 44 Magnum uh, because of Elmer Keith's uh, pushing and prodding of the Smith & Wesson Company in Remington and they, they finally came up with the load that uh, has become the classic 44 Magnum back in the 50s. But the 44 Special is a terrific cartridge to load uh, for plinking and for just having a lot of fun with, um, you know, very economically. Uh, they're very low cost, low cost rounds to shoot, and they're, you know, they're, they're very, they can be as accurate as any cartridge uh, in the world for a handgun cartridge. Uh, they're not necessarily any more accurate than any other cartridge, although they can be, uh, but they, they certainly are among uh, the most accurate revolver cartridges made. Two, some people can very simply uh, reduce the loads of 44 Magnum cases to arrive at 44 special loads. Now, <clears throat> I'll say this, you can do that. It's not necessarily the best way to go about things because the case capacity is much, much larger and uh, powder positioning is one factor which comes into the accuracy of uh, of any hand load. Uh, the, the 
powder should be more nearly matched, the, the quantity of powder, the, the volume of powder should be more nearly matched to the case capacity uh, as possible. So uh, whenever, you increase, whenever you increase the length of a case by a tenth of an inch, uh, you know, the, the low density of a high, uh, a fast burning, quick burning powder is barely a tenth of an inch as it is uh, in a case of that size. So when you increase the length of the case by a tenth of an inch, uh, you're increasing the volumetric uh, measurement of the case itself. And the positioning is, uh, you know, it, it ruins the positioning so the powder is not as close to the primer as it was before. Now that might not mean that much, but one thing it does mean is that because the volume of the case is larger, it can create uh, less pressure. And less pressure can of oftentimes result in a case which does not uh, expand fully in the chamber and thereby uh, blow by gases come backward beside the, beside the uh, case and can cause a very, very sooty chamber and very blackened cases, sooty, uh, dirty cases. And after just a few shots, uh, some, of that, some of that soot can build up on the what's called the recoil plate of the revolver. And when you have the uh, recoil plate of the revolver getting uh, filled with soot and smut, uh, it, causes, it causes dragging of the cases. Uh, the cases will no longer slide along the uh, recoil plate. And that can, cause, that can cause problems with cycling of the, re the revolver cylinder. So it's always best whether you're shooting a 357 Magnum or a 38 or a 44 Magnum or th uh, you know 44 Special. It's best when possible to uh, use the appropriate size case for the type of loads that you're going to be shooting. So if you're going to be shooting full power loads, by all means, you know put those 357 cases in and the 44 Magnum cases in. But if you're going to be intending to shoot target loads and uh, plinking loads, use the appropriate size cases which are smaller and designed for that particular velocity and power. And not only that, but it saves, it preserves the more expensive brass for the, for the, for the purpose that it is uh, intended. Now does it cause, does it cause uh, any gas cutting uh, inside the chamber? No. This, this is a myth. Um, there is no gas cutting inside. People will look inside and they'll see a ring. That sometimes is just simply a ring which occurs because of bullet lubricant uh, which has gotten spattered against the uh, end of the chamber. And that can be easily removed simply by solvent and things like that in a standard bore brush, uh, an oversized bore brush. Remember if you're using, uh, if you're using a bore brush on a, a 38 or a, a, you know, a 44 Special, whatever it is, you want to go to a next higher size bore brush uh, for your chamber because your, your chamber is much larger diameter than the bore itself. So you get a more efficient cleaning. But no, it doesn't cause any gas cutting. There's no such thing. Your, your pressures are so far down the scale on uh, low velocity loads uh, that they're, they're absolutely not going to cause any gas cutting. That's a very, very high grade steel. So uh, don't worry about that. If you're going to be shooting now, if you're going to be shooting mixtures of loads, uh, you know you want you might want to throw you might want to throw a, a a brush in your uh, in your tool kit uh, and bring it with you when you go shooting. Because if you're going to be shooting uh, 357s and 38s or 44 specials and 44 magnums, uh, you probably want to clean the chamber before you start shooting the larger cases. Otherwise, you might get a little stickiness if some of that lubricant. Uh, starts to uh, adhere to the end of the longer case, but those are all those are all little details that uh, I don't want you to be concerned about. Picking out a good load uh, is as simple as doing this. Determine the determine the type of usage that you're going to have. Uh, if you want to have a plinking load, if you want to have a standard velocity load, or if you want to have a magnum power load. And that's basically a that I, I kind of categorize that in loosely uh, using a standard using a standard weight bullet, whether it's 158 grain bullets, for, for instance, in a 38 or 357, or a 240 grain bullet in a 44 special or 44 magnum. Those are standard weight bullets, uh, and using those parameters, you know, uh, velocities that are in the range of about 650 to uh, 750 to 800 feet per second. That would be uh, that would be your, 
you know, you target planking loads uh, for just having a lot of fun with. Uh, there's, there's nothing more fun than just simply having a load that runs around uh, those velocities of 750 to 800 feet per second or even slower. Uh, you know, they, they head down range fairly slow, uh, but they get the job done. They can be as accurate as any loads, uh, and those, those are classically the ones that uh, years ago bullseye target shooters used to use uh, 3.2 grains, around about 3.2 grains of bullseye in their 38 specials with 147 grain wad cutter bullets, and that, that, was, a that was one of the classic loads uh, for uh, the short range uh, target shooter that was shooting out to 50 yards, and uh, you know, fantastic groups with that. Uh, those those bullets are going so slow that with the sun behind you uh, on your sights, you can actually see the if you're standing behind the shooter, you can see the bullets heading down range. So that would be the that would be the target that would be the target uh, velocity application. And when I say target velocity application, I'm talking about not just not just bullseye targets, but also you know steel plates and things like that, or tin cans, or dirt clods, or whatever you want to shoot. Uh, you know, targets of opportunity out in the field. Uh, th anything like that can be very accurate. Now, for for loads like that, it, I'm looking at my powder burning rate chart here. This is from this is from the Lee. This is from the Lee manual. This is to me one of the best powder burning rate charts uh, out there because it's all inclusive. It 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 includes all the different manufacturers' powders, and it categorizes them uh, together. So in other words, you're not just looking at Hodgdon's powder or Vitavori's powder or something like that. But if I look, uh, immediately I come to uh, bullseye powder. That's a classic, that's a classic, uh, you know, economical and accurate uh, powder for many, many cartridges. But in that same, in that same realm, uh, you know, you have Clays, you have uh, tight wad. There are there are there are powders which have become very popular for uh, for e economy and for oftentimes very accurate uh, competition. Uh, bullseye HP 38, uh, Winchester 231, and so forth. And all those powders run generally up to around tight group right here, and even trail boss, which is uh, burning rate number nine and ten. So these are these are your uh, you, any one of these can be used for uh, cowboy loads or target loads, plinking loads, and they can be extremely accurate. Now moving up the ramp, uh, then you can get into uh, the, the double digit powders, I'll call them here. This is uh, powder burning rate number uh, 11, 10, 11. You're running up into Green Dot. Um, green Dot is a shotgun powder, which is uh, very, very uh, accurate in many, many handguns. Uh, it's not necessarily a well advertised powder and you won't hear too much about it but it's an extremely good powder I have found for many different loads including the um, including the 45 uh, ACP uh, but those will run up to I would say around um, auto comp and power pistol HS6 uh, these powders up to about burning rate uh, burning rate number 18 or so uh, and, and even, uh, you know, even a little higher, but once you get up to about burning rate 18, you've, 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 this is your full power loads. These are your loads that will run with standard weight bullets up around uh, 850, 900, uh, even up to 1,000 feet per second in some cartridges uh, with standard bullets. Uh, now when you get into blue dot and long shot and um, these powders here, uh, 571 HS7, uh, and you'll start seeing powders with familiar names like Winchester 630 and, and Hercules uh, 2400 and Little Gun um, and H110 and 296. These are your magnum. These are your magnum powders, and those will get. Those will generally uh, be used only in magnum size cases, and I say that generally generally used in magnum size cases for magnum loads uh, running upwards of uh, beyond a thousand feet per second and sometimes much much uh, faster you know up to 1350 1400 feet per second and things like that with fairly heavy bullets so once you've determined what it is that you want to shoot the bullet weights 
and uh, w what your velocity range is. Use the appropriate powder for the particular uh, velocity that you're going to be using. And the reason I say that, you'll sometimes see, you'll sometimes see uh, where people will take uh, powders which are, uh, say, medium medium burning rate powders for a handgun. Uh, they might take um, they might take HS6, for instance. Um, let's see if I have it here. Uh, I don't have HS6, but I have power pistol. Um, so, in fact, I think I have yes, I have HS6 over at my uh, load master. But power pistol, for instance, this is this is a, a powder which is used for, generally speaking, standard velocity uh, loads. Uh, that will be that's right up there. Remember the the burning rates I was talking about. This is right up there at the top of the medium uh, chart. This is number eighteen. That would be number eighteen on the um, on the uh, Lee book page. And that's what I do with my powders. I just for just for a quick reference, I'll put the uh, approximate burning rate so I can just take a look at the powders and if I've forgotten approximately what the powders are doing uh, that that'll give me that'll give me my quick reference so and 2400 uh, has a burning rate of 24 it doesn't it just happens that way it's nothing nothing anybody planned I don't think but if you take a powder for instance such as HS6 and power pistol and you throttle it back and you try to get a uh, low velocity load, which you can do. You can, you can load down those uh, powders and you can achieve you know, fairly good accuracy sometimes. But very frequently you'll get extremely dirty performance. In other words, the powder is not, the powder is not burning uh, at a rate which will expand that uh, cartridge case fully against the chamber and you'll get people complaining about sooty chambers and dirty guns and things of that sort because you know and you'll see people who are very very correctly saying you know you have to boost you have to boost your powder charges with that powder in order to get a clean burn and that's true because uh, the cases have to uh, fill the chamber and uh, they, they have to generate enough pressure in order to uh, quickly in other words the, the pressure can build going down the barrel with slow burning powders, that's how it works. Slower burning powders build pressure as it uh, goes down the barrel as the powder burns and consumes. So uh, it more fully, the, the, the fullest pressures are generated uh, at a longer cycle than quick burning powder, quicker burning powders. Quicker burning powders such as bullseye and red dot, green dot, and things of that sort. Uh, and and uh, accurate number two, even accurate number five, those powders are quick enough burning so that they expand the case quickly and they get the they get the work done before the bullet gets very far down the barrel that brings up another that brings up another point which is important to remember if you're if you're shooting a if you're shooting a snub nose if you're shooting a gun which has got a a short a very short barrel um, you're you're far better off selecting powders which are in a quicker burning category now you certainly have to keep you certainly have to keep your wits about you you don't want to be you don't want to be driving you don't want to be driving uh, velocities up using quick burning powders beyond the listed maximums because you can easily blow your gun up quick burning powders are very very uh, sensitive to uh, powder charge increases and they can very very easily wreck a gun I have seen in my life uh, a few unfortunate cases where that happened, and uh, entire cylinders uh, blown right in two, uh, top straps blown off, uh, barrels barrels basically just dis disconnected from a receiver. The the frame uh, shears right off. It's it's an incredible amount of uh, energy that goes off. It's like a stick of dynamite uh, when somebody double charges or triple charges a, uh, you know, a load of bullseye thinking that it was, you, you know, unique or something like that or 2400. Uh, they, they can sometimes get, uh, they can sometimes get this way. You've got to be very careful to watch your data, make sure that you stay within the uh, guidelines, uh, with, especially with pistols. It's really, really, uh, important. It's so easy to, <clears throat> It's so easy to triple or sometimes even quadruple charge a case with uh, bullseye 
uh, or any of those faster powders that you can easily wreck a gun. So you got to be very sure you always maintain the standard rule that I have uh, insisted on is keep only one uh, pound of powder on the bench at any given time and never, you know, at your machine. When I say on the bench, you know, I've got a load master over there. That workstation is by itself, but I keep the pound of powder right over there by the work by the load master, and that's the only powder that I'll have out. This is a different workstation, and whatever powder I'm working with that one is that's when I say on the bench. So always keep adjacent to your machine the powder that you're going to be using, and don't have any other powders out and available because if you ever, there are some powders that have uh, extremely uh, similar uh, appearance. A classic example is uh, Winchester 296 and, and, and Hodgdon 110, which are identical powders, by the way, uh, but still follow the powder manufacturer's recommendations, but those are the same powders. But those two powders uh, will look identical to Accurate Number 7. The big difference is, is that if you were to ever load uh, Accurate Number 7 to the load densities that you typically load H110 or 296, that's a finny gun. Your gun is done with and it could possibly kill you or, or injure you. So you've got to be very, very careful and don't ever assume when you pull bullets out, when you're, you know, uh, pulling bullets and, and using uh, powder from within cases, don't just discard that stuff unless you're absolutely certain you've marked, you know, on those loads and you know exactly what's in, so, in those cases. Uh, that's the only time when you can re reuse and salvage that powder. But uh, unless you are absolutely positive and it's, the, it's loads that you made and you marked those loads and you know that you never uh, that you never mess around with you know changing things midstream that's the only time but you got to be very careful rifle cases unless you're using reduced loads with cast bullets uh, most rifle powders are you know very dense they fill a case up uh, quite enough so that you can never double charge any double charge with even a light load will generally overfill a case to spilling over. So, but with pistols, that's not that's not the the case at all. Pistols and revolvers, there are so many loads that uh, can very easily spill either without spilling over the case. They can very easily accept a second or even a third charge. And certainly, if you if you miscalculate which powder that you're using, uh, you can be in a in a bad way. Now, your magnum powders, I just want to go back down through the list. Your magnum powders, make sure that you're using the appropriate primer. Uh, some manufacturers, for instance, Winchester, just the, w, uh, the Winchester Large Pistol WLP primer, that is a combined usage primer. That's, uh, I've, I've gone over this, I want you to watch my, my other videos that are relevant. But see, this is, this is the Winchester Large Pistol primary and you notice that it's for standard or magnum pistol loads. So the WLP is an all-purpose uh, large pistol primer. Uh, on the other hand, the CCI version is a CCI 300 primer for large pistol and they have a 350 for magnum uh, pistol. Now that, I never use, I never use any magnum primers unless it specifically calls for it and I want you to go back through my primer video and I'll, I'll give a full rundown on that. But uh, certain powders such as H110 and uh, 296 uh, ball powders, those, those definitely require a magnum primer in order to have uh, reliable ignition uh, and, or that that all-purpose Winchester primer is, is fine too. Now there are other companies that have had, uh, I, I can't remember which, which of the four companies has the, the other all-purpose primer, but um, I think it's Remington. Uh, but in, in those cases, uh, those primers are more than sufficient and you don't have to get a special Magnum primer. They're, they're designed for that. Remember those companies, Remington was the company that first loaded the um, 44 Magnum, so they know exactly what they're doing with it with their primer. You don't have to try to second guess their loading. Okay, the uh, loading density, make sure that when you're using uh, lighter charges with uh, quick burning powders, be absolutely positive that you maintain the 
correct progression. If you're using, if you're using a uh, semi-progressive uh, press, make sure that you're just cycling correctly. Uh, if you're using it in a single stage mode or a single stage press, make sure that you keep your loading blocks always organized so that you are doing one operation at a time. Uh, be sure that you also have yourself a, a flashlight so that you can look down in the cases or have good overhead lighting so that you can look. I like to use a flashlight because I can actually physically move the light down from case to case before you go putting those, uh, if, if using a single stage operation, before you go to the next stage, be sure you look down each of those cases and make sure they all look the same. So that way they immediately spot if you have a, uh, an uncharged case. You'll immediately spot if you have a case which is double charged and so forth so that you don't uh, have a problem. This has been a problem, you know, when you have a, when you have a um, special powder station, whether you're using a bench model one or whether you're using a hand operated uh, powder dispenser, those are great machines. This is, I, I use this all the time for dispensing powder. Uh, but it's, it's very easy with pistols to, uh, you know, turn away, uh, you know, maybe somebody is calling you in another room or something like that, you get distracted. It's very easy to go back to the same case and give it another bump and you end up with a double charge and a blown up gun. So it's always very good to, first of all, be uh, in a situation where you're not distracted. You make sure that you uh, isolate yourself so that you don't have any distractions and check your check your cases and be absolutely certain that they look identical and if there's any if there's any question whatsoever dump it and redo it uh, if you're using a progressive or semi-progressive press just make sure you uh, do everything that the manufacturer calls for with that press to be sure that you're progressing uh, correctly and that you're not you're not double cycling the handle uh, on the on the press the load master really can't be double cycled like that that powder will not release until it's all the way up uh, but uh, just the same, you want to be very, very certain what you're doing at all times. Okay, um, but with this particular, this particular load test series, I want to replicate for you. I want to show you how you go through the process of, um, you know, first of all, selecting powder, um, how to uh, match it to your correct bullet weight, uh, the primer and so forth, and we're just gonna we're just gonna do a, a test series. We're gonna do an incremental test series, and fast burning powders are uh, you know you're dealing with you're dealing with increments that are very very small. I have here. Uh, let's see. We'll turn to my 44 special loading data now. We're going to be using a 240 grain uh, bullet, cast lead bullet that I've made. Um, now, <clears throat> I've never, I've never tried accurate number two with the 44 special, but I'm going to do that in this test series. So that you're going to be, you're going to be with me as we do the loading and we uh, go to the range with it and do our testing. So you'll be, you'll be witness to this whole process and you'll see how uh, I progress with this and. The reason I picked accurate number two would be accurate number two is in that same general powder burning rate as uh, red dot powder. Now I've had fabulous results with red dot powder. Um, the uh, old Alliant, uh, it used to be Hercules red dot powder. That's, that's this stuff right here. This has got the identifying flakes in it and stuff. Uh, I've, had, I've had extremely good uh, results with red dot powder. Now, <clears throat> red dot powder is, is very uniform in uh, dispensing. I've had, no, I've had no issues whatsoever with dispensing uh, red dot powder. It's a flake powder. Flake powders, on the other hand, can have issues with uh, very light charges. We're going to be ch uh, charging cases uh, it, it basically uh, at less than around about five grains. Uh, at five grains, a tenth, a tenth of a, uh, I should say a hundredth of a charge, that's, that's only uh, a, a half, a, it's a half a tenth. Well, none of your, none of your loading equipment can accurately 
uh, charge to a half a tenth, and that's that's that nobody ever charges to less than a tenth of a grain, and it's not necessary to charge to less than a tenth of a grain. But that tenth of a grain increment is very very important to adhere to with such light load because with uh, Oh, I see Cat has arrived here. I hope she's not going to be a pain. Um, with a 240 grain bullet, we're talking about a starting charge of 4.2 grains, working up to a uh, maximum charge of 4.7 grains of accurate number two. So that's a half a grain uh, from bottom to top. That's perfect for that's perfect for doing an incremental test series uh, of five five different tests, five different lots, running up a tenth of a grain at a time. That, that's, a perfect, that's a perfect situation. So what I've done here is I've organized, I'm going to be running the block, I'm going to be running the block instead of my normal progression is to move them this way, uh, I'm going to be moving the block by tests are going to be one, two, three, four, five. I'm going to be running six, I'm going to be running six charges of each of each lot and <clears throat> why well I, I could do it with I could do it with three uh, or four the same as I do with a rifle but with a handgun you know you, each one of these chambers is a is a potential for a uh, different situation Ruger Smith & Wesson Colt they all make extremely uh, high-grade guns uh, and and other Taurus and all these other companies they make extremely high grade guns and the cylinders are replicated on machinery that uh, I, I would I would almost invariably say that uh, they are they are identical without any question but there is there is a particular there is a particular difference that could occur and that's with regard to lockup lockup with a uh, lock up with a re revolver is something which I test the lock up with a revolver by making sure that it has the same feel as it goes from one cylinder to the next and it's not supposed to be it's not supposed to be absolutely tight if you watch my uh, Smith & Wesson uh, video where I uh, take a part of Smith & Wesson and go through the process uh, there has to be some slight movement in that in that lock up uh, fail, that's why there's a forcing cone here because the the, vari the variations in that slight uh, lockup are taken care of by the forcing cone. Nevertheless, there can be uh, variations in the lockup to a degree which could possibly potentially affect the accuracy of a charge. So I like to just I just like to uh, fill up every single uh, chamber in the cylinder and do a complete test and that way I don't have to concern myself uh, whether the the flyer that might come out of the group by a half inch or three quarters of an inch or an inch or something like that that flyer at least gets a chance to be replicated if it's a cylinder issue it gets to be replicated with each one of the uh, with each one of the test lots and I don't have to condemn a test lot simply because of that particular flyer every every uh, every test gets to do the same chamber now there's another way of doing it. I could certainly mark, I could certainly mark a particular chamber, and I could run uh, a test of three loads, uh, three three uh, particular loads per lot, and I could simply use the same chamber uh, for each for each test. That I could do that, and that would all, or, or I could test the same three chambers or whatever, just by marking them with uh, maybe paint that can be removed later. Or, you know, uh, lipstick or something like that, but that that I could also do. But you know, shooting is fun, so I'm just going to simply load up six per six per lot. And again, I'm going to be working with a very fast, quick burning powder, so I'm going to be working at tenth of a grain increments. That's as low as that's as low as practical, and you don't have to go any lower than that. A tenth uh, a, a tenth of a grain uh, increment will give me a surprisingly uh, different uh, shot variation on paper. I'm almost confident to say that. Um, I, have, I have sometimes been, uh, I've been really amazed by the differences that uh, one and two tenths of a grain charge uh, weight can make in a handgun load. Um, I, have, I have frequently been to the range with uh, various handguns uh, doing test lot series 
and I will be dismayed by the size of the group at 25 yards. It'll be a three or four or five inch group, and I'll say this this powder is just not working. It's just and all of a sudden I try the next lot and it it just shrinks down to nothing. And all of a sudden I've got a, a one and a half inch group at 25 yards, and and the adjacent the adjacent charges in the block are just not working out. Now that brings up another that brings up another point. If you're using a if you're using a particular powder, it's always good to use a powder which doesn't have that particular fussiness that's not that's not that uh, demanding because a powder which is that demanding uh, can let you down. If you have a for instance a case which is over heavy, uh, changes its case volume. If you happen to have a, a, a primer which is not the same uh, flash as others. So when you're dealing with when you're dealing with uh, or even temperature changes and things like that, so I I tend to steer clear of powders that have that degree of fussiness. They can be fun. I mean, if you have if you have very frequently, you can have a powder which uh, will deliver supremely uh, good accuracy with a particular charge, and it's it's a nice load to have just when you want to impress yourself and your friends and everything and and have uh, a super accurate load, but. Uh, it's always best to maybe tr check out a different powder and see if it's, there's a powder which is not quite so fussy about zeroing in. I have found that to be the case with quite a number of powders, for instance. Uh, you know, there's, there's so many good uh, pistol powders out there that have been out there for so many years, and while, the, while one particular load uh, might be just perfect for your gun, uh, any number of loads with that powder will work out just as well for practical purposes. Okay, so I've assembled. Uh, I've got my cases, and as I say, I'm going to be working. I'm going to be working the block in this fashion, a tenth of a grain at a time, uh, working up, uh, just working up that load. And I said that I am using a 240 grain load, uh, beginning at 4.2 grains. I'm going to be working up to a maximum of 4.7. I don't know which one of those loads is going to work. Uh, I'm going to also be using uh, CCI. I'm just happen I happen to have uh, 300 left before I move over to my uh, Winchester primers that I've got a much larger amount. But I'm going to use these up. It's quite possible that when I change primers that um, I'll have similar performance, but I won't count on it. I'll be using Accurate Number Two as I showed you. Uh, that's going to be the powder of choice today. I don't know if it's going to work. And I'm going to be using 240 grain hard cast uh, bullets. These these bullets I have uh, I have successfully driven these bullets at 1,200 feet per second. So uh, they're they're a little bit they're a little bit on the hard side for uh, you know for light loads, uh, but they are they are sized oversized by a thousandth of an inch. So I shouldn't have any obturation problems, and they should be just fine. Uh, and I've got my special, my 44 special dies. Just so you know, 44 special dies and, and uh, 38 special dies these days are, they're manufactured so that they also do double duty as uh, 357 and 44 Magnum dies. However, just because I like to set them up and leave them set up, I got, you know, I got a, a set of uh, 44 special dies and a set of uh, 44 special dies that I simply set up as 44 Magnum dies, and that's that's all I have to do without having to use a special washer to go back and forth, that tenth of an inch. So that's it. So we're ready to begin. Now these cases here are brand new. Uh, they're shiny, clean, and just by looking at them, I can tell there uh, there's no distortion whatsoever. Uh, they're Starline cases. I love Starline cases. They're just they're just nicely made. They're they're a uh, subsidiary of uh, Sierra Bullet Company. They just do a nice job. Um, they're primarily just uh, straight wall case uh, designs. But uh, for for a lot of handguns, uh, that's that's my uh, case of choice. They're they're also quite economical. You can buy them direct from the Starline Company. Um, so I don't necessarily have to. Uh, 
resize them, but because uh, it doesn't require any lubrication, uh, it's easy enough to do. These are, this is a carbide sizing die, and the carbide sizing die doesn't require any uh, lubrication for the case, and it's absolutely unnecessary. Uh, I've, I've got, I'm going to put 40 primers in the tray. The reason I'm putting in 40 primers, even though I've only got uh, 30 cases, is simply because the last, the last couple of primers sometimes don't uh, drop into the uh, drop into the bin as easily. Now there's a trick for doing this. If you if you take your if you take your primers from your sleeve, and never ever I've told you this before, never ever you know put these into a bulk packaging like into a, a jar, mason jar or anything like that because uh, they they have to be kept independent from each other so they don't blow up. Um, they're highly explosive. Just do you do that? You just expose the number of primers you want to use. Put your tray on top and flip it over. If you have any, and that avoids having to flip them. Uh, if you have, sometimes those primers will have a few of the primers inverted, so you just simply shake them around and that will uh, orient them. Make sure your primers are all oriented uh, in the correct position so that you can see the anvils. Uh, get them started down in the tray in whatever system that you use. I, I really like this uh, I really like this system because I can take it off uh, and get it out of the way when it's not necessary. Now I'll simply put these primers away. I don't like to have anything on the bench that's uh, not necessary and always keep your pistol primers and your rifle primers segregated because they're, they're not the same and uh, they you can get into serious trouble if you try to uh, if you try to uh, use them for the wrong purposes. The uh, rifle primers are taller and will sit more proud in the case and can have, uh, they can have serious issues with uh, slam firing in, uh, you know, in, in certain types of uh, pistols. You can have uh, primers that are, if rifle primers simply will not fire in many handguns simply because they, the, uh, the uh, cups are thicker and harder. And also, if they do, uh, they can certainly uh, cause problems with pressure and uh, overgenerate uh, way too much, uh, way too much flash. So we'll begin. We've got the correct shell holder in here. I'm just going to run it up into the. I'm going to run it up into the die. Uh, drop my primer in, and it's this is this is why I like this. It's so easy, uh, and drop the primer into the case. I've got a nice, I've got a nicely uh, primed case, and we'll just simply move along with each of those, and we'll get back to you when I'm done. And you notice that what I'm doing here is I'm running up the block. I'm getting, I'm getting my mind oriented towards moving in this direction. Uh, so that I'm I'm not turning the block sideways and moving left to right because that's how I orient the cases if I'm loading my lots uh, in that progression. But I'm loading my lots in this progression, so I want to get my mind around that, wrap my head around that. So that's the direction that I'm going to be going. So I'll I'll be back when I'm done with this project. Okay, we finished up this priming project. Let's move over to the powder station. Now the very first thing that you want to do is make sure that you're, uh, whether you're using a digital uh, scale or a balanced beam scale like this, you want to be absolutely certain that you've zeroed out and uh, that the uh, balanced beam comes to zero or use your test, use your test weights or whatever it is is the case. But make sure that you're uh, dead zero before you begin because you're working with you're working with highly sensitive uh, pistol charges that uh, small variations can make a big difference. So we've zeroed it out. Uh, we go back to our book and uh, never never relegate anything to memory. The first thing we want to do is start out with uh, 4.2 grains. So 4.2 grains. I just simply move the uh, we're right up to 4.2. These are tenth of a grain increments. So with this old uh, 502 measure that uh, I've had for, I've had this measure for over 45 years. It works beautifully and it's just like it was new. Uh, so I've got 4.2 grains set up. 
this makes a handy this makes a handy little scoop here this is a, a the Lee measure uh, I'll simply go into the powder now one of the reasons why I'm trying this powder I, I've always had good results with red dot but this is a similar burning rate and it's a very very fine it's a very very fine let's see if I can find this on the camera can you see that um, I'm not sure if that's uh, focusing in on it but that's a very very fine ball powder spherical powder so it's a double base powder um, I'm gonna see if I can replicate the uh, same type of results that I get with uh, red dot never under any circumstances and I've said this before never under any circumstances presume that just because a powder is the same burning rate that it, it is the uh, same uh, charge weight that's an entirely different thing uh, what I'm doing right now is I'm, I'm weighing up you're gonna say this is awful tedious it's gonna take me forever well I'm weighing up exactly I've got 4.2 grains on my scale so that's not the uh, that's not the way that I'm going to be uh, charging all my uh, charges what I'm going to do now is simply drop it into my uh, into my powder measure and I'll show you how that works now the powder measure uh, I've got my small drum in it if you've used the smallest drum that you have available this is a standard small drum it's not a pistol uh, small drum but it, it should work fine uh, this this drum has been accurate enough for uh, charging light amounts of powder so the first thing I want to do is simply drop it into my measure make sure that the measure has been cleared of any previous powder at the bottom uh, you'll look inside and make sure that your powder has fl flowed uh, into the charge hole uh, turn your turn your piston sideways your cylinder sideways and you'll you have to back your lock ring all the way off quite a ways and screw in the um, screw in the stem now what I'm doing is I'm I'm turning the stem so that I'm turning the stem so that it's sideways okay so I've screwed the stem in until it's touching the powder uh, now my guess is as good as yours as to whether this uh, charging system I sure hope it does I sure hope that this I can I can use this particular charging system with uh, red dot powder and I've used it with green dot powder and bullseye and everything so I haven't used it with uh, this uh, spherical powder so I don't know whether this particular drum uh, is going to be sufficiently small for that purpose uh, but we'll see so let's check it out uh, what I did was I simply moved that stem sideways against the back of this the back of this housing and that uh, placed the stem so that it's sitting at uh, theoretically at the charge weight that I desire now it's not going to be I don't presume that that will be the finished charge weight again keep the powder uh, close at hand make sure you have no other powders uh, around and uh, I'll be using the scale uh, for each of the for the, each of the increments but I don't have to uh, I don't have to uh, use the scale for individually charging them if uh, everything goes well um, so we'll just see how this thing goes first of all I want to dump uh, a couple of charges in the pan and return them to the pot Well, as a matter of fact, it looks like we're going to be able to do it. So I'm going to open this up just a little bit. I've got, uh, I'm running a little bit light. I'm very, very close to my, watch that balance beam over here now uh, as it runs to zero. I just, I'm fascinated I've, ever since I've gotten this scale 40 something years ago, I've always been fascinated to watch uh, the accuracy of these uh, balance beam scales it's just like an old uh, doctor scale uh, you know you can't you can't mess with weight I mean it does it just doesn't change so I don't have to worry about uh, integrated circuits or anything like that or batteries it's just always right there so I've got a good accurate powder charge um, that is repeatable and uh, I'm ready to go now <clears throat> all I have to do is make sure I charge my six cases with this first charge uh, with the uh, with the powder measure let's do that 
Now, my strong recommendation is that you don't get fancy. Uh, yes, you can, you know, this, this has got a wide enough bridge here that I could move down the cases and do it uh, like this and charge each one as I go. Um, very frequently what happens when you do that is that you'll, uh, you'll, bump, you'll bump your block uh, you'll see powder on your you'll see powder on your block that uh, you don't know where it came from. You don't know whether it came from one of the adjacent cases. So uh, rather than messing up a whole series, it's a lot easier to just simply pick up a case, uh, charge it directly. Now I've got to be sure that I've got the large funnel. There's an inverted funnel here. Uh, this is the small one I'm changing it I'm changing it to the large diameter hole so that's this one right here uh, because I want to make sure that I use the largest in any case make sure I use the largest diameter hole uh, for the uh, purpose all right so I'm just simply going to charge one case at a time it'll take me no time at all I'll move down the block and I'll be back with you when I get done with the entire series. Um, what I'm going to do is simply adjust my scale, open up my uh, powder drum each time uh, for different increments, and I'm going to move up uh, one-tenth of a grain at, uh, at a time. It'll be very, very simple. So when we're all done charging all these cases with the, different, the uh, five different lots, we'll come back and we'll uh, finish up the loading. Okay, we're done with the powder charging. I forgot to keep in mind that while we're dealing with a half grain uh, charge weight difference between the lowest and the highest charge, 4.2 to 4.7, uh, it actually involves uh, six tenths of a grain uh, inclusive. So I've got a separate I've got a separate row up here, which is my uh, 4.7 grain increment. Now I'm just going to take one of those cases. I want to show you the hazard involved with. Um, with this particular low density powder. If you can see inside that case, I don't know if you can see inside there, but that's a very, very small amount of powder. Uh, and it's very, very easy to uh, not pick up uh, even if you're comparing them. If I double charge, if I double charge a case, uh, it, it barely comes up uh, halfway up that case. It'd be very, very easy for me to put that down and to look across the cases and if I'm not careful, I could fail to observe that that is a uh, overcharge. I'll show you how many you could get in there. I've, that's, that's the third charge. I could very easily see the bullet on top of that charge, and I'd have a, a three, a triple charge case that would absolutely, most certainly blow up uh, the strongest handgun made. So we want to return that to the Make sure I have no powder remaining in that case whatsoever. I'll recharge it with my last increment. And by the way, I'll show you that. That is 4.7. There we go. 4.7 right on the scale. So we're all set. I can't repeat this enough. Before I begin, I'm loading from a loading block. This is, this is extremely... Uh, hazardous procedure to load from a loading block if you have uh, a double charge case. Uh, having a squib load is also potentially dangerous because a squib load is a load which only the primer goes off and there's no powder charge and the bullet will get lodged in the barrel. Uh, and if you're firing rapid fire you may uh, not stop yourself in time and if you discharge a round on top of a, a large bullet you could easily have a bulged barrel or worse. So I'll take my flashlight and go along each of these cases and visually inspect them. Your eye is sensitive, sensitive enough to pick up any variations in uh, depth. So just go along with your flashlight, and I prefer to use a flashlight because that really uh, highlights each one of those cases, and you can assure yourself that there are no variations and no double charges. A double charge, even with something like four point. Uh, two or four point six grains will easily show up as a uh, grossly overcharged case. Now we're going to advance from the case uh, resizing die and uh, primer seating operation, turn it towards the case mouth expanding die and 
powder charging die. Now we've already we've already charged all these cases with powder, so that's not a necessary operation. When this die comes from the manufacturer, when it's packaged, uh, it comes with this it comes with this plug right here. This particular this particular plug has a hole in it, and that also accepts the uh, Lee powder funnel. So I could actually charge I could actually charge my cases directly, uh, either with a uh, scoop, uh, which is which is perfectly acceptable. Uh, or I could remove that plug and I could put a one of these any number of different uh, powder dispensing systems on there that are automated so that as I if I cycled this in a uh, pro semi progressive fashion using the using the progressive uh, advancing stem then I could uh, simply keep on going as I do one uh, round at a time, but because we're doing an incremental test, we want to just make sure that we're expanding the case mouth. Now you can't expand the case mouth without using this plug because this plug retards and holds in place the uh, the uh, stem, which expands the case. So this that's this is a double duty plug. This keeps that expand expanding stem in place. Uh, it's already been it's already been set so that it does a uh, perfect expansion of the case. You want to always maintain uh, the the least amount of expansion on the the mouth of the case uh, that will work. Too often I see people uh, really belling that uh, case mouth. You really don't want to have uh, more case belling than you absolutely need. The only the only thing that's necessary, the only prerequisite is that it fits into the uh, that the bullet fits into the case readily without uh, you know grabbing the edge which would uh, collapse the case so we're going to do that keeping in mind now that we have powder in each one of these cases we've got to move progressively uh, along we're going to keep always moving in that same progression that I spoke of earlier uh, front to rear and when we withdraw this stem it's it's going to want to. It's going to want to pop out. So we want to be very careful that we uh, push it down and pull it back gently as you can, so that it doesn't upset the powder. You don't want powder uh, popping up. Uh, but don't worry about it. It's going to be fine. Now I'm going to test. I'm going to test the bullet and make sure that uh, it fits into the case, and it does. It fits in beautifully. So. In other words, it, it just enough just enough of a bell, but it's not uh, it, it's not so much that it, you don't want it to look like it's a big flare. Uh, it's very very rare that you have to have uh, such a uh, obvious flare. So I'll just work along these, and I will uh, carefully uh, bell each mouth, and I will return at the end of that operation. And again, don't just pull them up hastily uh, when. When you're doing when you're doing this operation, always keep in mind that we're doing a, a test series. This is not there's no uh, hurry involved with this. This is a test series so that you can determine uh, what the most accurate charge is for your particular gun, and then we work from there. Uh, so we want to try to maintain some sort of uniformity. If you really want to get uh, you know extremely uniform, then you could certainly uh, weigh your bullets out and uh, be sure that uh, each of your bullets weighs exactly the same. But you know, the, in, a, in a practical situation, what we're dealing here is uh, cast bullets that we're going to be plinking with or even doing informal target shooting with. And in all likelihood, uh, that's not going to be uh, of, a, of as big an issue as you might think. Um, there's very, very uh, little variation uh, between uh, bullets in a uh, cast bullet die, um, and even even variations of as much as uh, one or two grains uh, in a handgun bullet is uh, is is hardly uh, perceivable on paper, uh, if at all. So when I, as I'm withdrawing this, as I'm withdrawing it, I'll bring back the, uh, so you can see. Gentle is the key, and try to support that handle on the way back. I'm, 
I'm pulling it up, I'm pulling up. When it gets to this point here and there's resistance, that's because that plug, that uh, seating, that uh, expanding stem is pulling out of that brass. I want to pull back gently so that I don't pop that powder up and down and dislodge the uh, powder. It, and remember, this, this is also a powder charging die, so any powder that pops up drops right back down in. But that's what we want to do. We want to make sure that uh, it's, as, it's as gentle as possible so that we don't upset things. I've completed my uh, case mouth expansion uh, setup, so now we swing the die around to uh, the bullet seating stem. Now remember, uh, I'm using this as a single station die, even though it's set up to be a semi-progressive press. <clears throat> uh, I've done a little bit of housekeeping. First of all, I've taken, uh, this is the sort of thing that all hand loaders need to do. Uh, and this is, this is very important, is to record all your data. Uh, you can summarize it on a label like this, but I also like to keep a diary, as I have shown in my other loading videos. Keep a diary where you list on the page exactly what you did. In case this is a good setup, uh, if you find the correct load, you have a written record of it. And guess what? If it's a bad setup, if, you'd have, if you have nothing but bogus loads that don't work out to your satisfaction, uh, keep the page so that you'll know in the future so you don't replicate your own mistake a couple of years later down the line because it's so easy to forget what you've uh, done. Uh, so I've got my, I got my label here with the date, 44 Special, Starline Cases New, uh, CCI 300 Primers, Accurate Number 2 Powder. I'm working with a test series of 4.2 to 4.7 grain increments. These are cast Lee 240 grain bullets. Now I've gone through I've gone through a bunch of bullets and made sure that I have a, a good selection of bullets that have no wrinkles, you know, from uh, uh, temperature problems, uh, have no have no bad bases or anything like that. Because I want to have a verifiable test that uh, doesn't rely on quality of bullets. So the bullets are all uh, visually in good shape. I didn't bother. Uh, weighing them. There's no, there's no need to weigh them for this sort of, uh, this sort of uh, accuracy testing. They're going to be even if they're within uh, one or two grains of bullet weight. They're going to be the, they're going to be the same. Uh, and it's for my Red Hawk. Uh, this may not be applicable if I had another 44 special. So I know exactly which, ri uh, which rifle or handgun, whichever it is that I'm testing. Now I'm going to be working right from the wooden loading block. Uh, as I get done, I'll go right to the, uh, I'll, I'll put them right into the uh, finished box. Now, I've backed off the seating stem, even though I am fairly certain that I had the correct seating depth to begin with. Uh, I backed off the seating stem, which is always good practice if you're going to a bullet, you, you're not sure if you've loaded before. If you back off the seating stem, you can always add more seating depth and progressively add it. Uh, but it's, it's, you can't you can't take it away without pulling your bullet pulling your bullet out physically. Now I want to make sure that I have uh, nothing uh, in the way, so I, I I left I left the priming uh, setup off it, so it's not dangling in the way. I don't need to have that. So I simply have my bullet in position, position it as uh, straight as possible, and just guide it into your die. Uh, and seat it. Now some people have asked me, uh, they're concerned about the wiggle factor in this. Remember the wiggle is consistent, it's constant. In other words, the, uh, the, the deflection is always exactly the same, right to the thousandths of an inch. You can't possibly change it. I mean the deflection of this steel and aluminum together and the cast iron, nothing changes from one shot to another. So it doesn't make any difference how much it jiggles as long as it's always the same jiggle. So that's it. So now I inspect my I inspect my round, and as you can see, obviously I'm seated way way long. What my goal is is to uh, seat so that my first driving band is uh, uh, visible. So my first my first driving band should be above my crimp. Uh, that will prevent the bullet from uh, seating deeper in the case when I when I bring that crimp around, it'll be inside that first groove. So that's my goal. So I'm gonna, I've got witness marks on top of my die. I've ta simply taken a, uh, a, a felt tip pen, a Sharpie, and made a witness mark on the top of my stem. So I'm gonna turn that stem a half a turn just to see how much, I, I wanna see how much a half a turn brings it down. 
I'm going to bring it down a full turn because I know that it's going to take at least a full turn to make a measurable effect on that. And we'll see how much that uh, moves that bullet into the case. Okay, it seemed to move it in about uh, probably half as far as it ought to, but I'm going to be a little cautious here. I'm going to go about three quarters of a turn, uh, try it again. I'm going to avoid uh, over overseeding. I'm very, very close. If you notice now, uh, I'm very, very close to having that case uh, exactly where I want. So I'll just simply advance it to the uh, just a just a snook. I want to have a I want to have a place. This is a hard bullet. I want to have a place for that case to wrap right around one of the driving bands. I'm not quite there. Bring it down just a tiny bit. And always make a full stroke with the press. That's all there is to it. Now, actually I said I was going to move them right to the red block, but that's not really so, uh, true because I still haven't yet uh, done my crimping operation. So we're just simply going to move along, and I'll get back to you when these are all seated. Um, and as you can see, I'm just, it's a simple matter. Don't never slam your press. Never, never slam the uh, press uh, ram. Always a smooth operation. Keep keep things smooth. Keep your fingers out of the way. This will do a nice job of giving you a nice black and blue fingernail. So I'll be back in just a moment. All right, we've completed our loading block. Each one of our bullets has been seated uh, to the correct depth. Now we turn our attention to our. Uh, crimping operation, crimping die. But before we do that, I'm going to be putting these right directly into uh, the storage box. So on each side, uh, on the end of it, just so I uh, have a ready reference, this is going to be load number one, number two, number three, number four, and number five, just so I don't uh, mix the orientation up and on the last one I'm going to put number six just as it is just as it is on the uh, loading block and that will keep everything oriented correctly. Now <clears throat> whether you have a Lee system or RCBS or Redding or whomever you use make sure you follow their uh, their die directions for proper uh, bullet crimping. It's very important with uh, revolver cases to uh, crimp the bullets uh, for consistent ignition. Uh, crimping the bullet means uh, that your your case is turned inward into that into that driving band. It's very important to make sure that you provide a driving band access where that uh, the case mouth can uh, basically be wrapped around it. Now you can't do that with 45 ACPs or 40 Smith & Wesson's or 9mm Lugers or 380's or anything like that because those cases head space not on the rim but they head space on the case mouth. That case mouth has got to be blunt so that it uh, strikes the end of the chamber and resists uh, further seating into the into the chamber. You absolutely cannot do a roll crimp. Not, you don't have to worry about it because uh, the dies that are provided for those uh, cartridges are made to have uh, the correct type of uh, crimp, which is either a taper crimp or with this type of uh, a lead die as a factory uh, crimp, which post sizes, P-O-S-T, that doesn't, that doesn't mean like a post as in a, a wooden stick. That means that it's after after the uh, after the, uh, the the case has been inserted and the whole cartridge is resized it actually sizes down the entire cartridge uh, to fit the chamber to factory dimension so even though you've already done that once there's a uh, there's a uh, provision so that that post sizes and it's a really nice it's a really nice die setup so I'm gonna just simply check uh, I've I've I should have uh, I should have that turned to my bullet crimping die, run it in, and check my, check my crimp, and it should, it, just as you see it, it has a nice roll to it. You're no longer looking at the dead end of that case. The case is buried uh, in the side of that bullet. Now, if you have any wrinkling of your case, that means that you uh, pr probably don't have the 
driving band groove uh, positioned correctly and you're being resisted. It's not the case is unable to uh, find a home and as a result it's going the case is going to just simply move down in the die in order to find a home for itself and you're going to end up with a wrinkled buckled case. So that's a case you're going to have to destroy you just get rid of it. But you should be very careful as long as you have that driving band positioned so that uh, the, or a crimping groove. A lot of bullets are made with a specific crimping groove, and these bullets, these are all pretty much the, pretty much the same. Um, the uh, the crimping grooves are, are simply the uh, the various driving bands, the lubrication grooves. So you use the you use the top one to position the case. And why don't I go around the uh, top of the bullet? Well, it's very simple because I not only want to resist the bullet from pulling out, but I also want to resist the bullet from being pushed in. So by having it uh, between the first uh, two driving bands, that gives me that uh, perfect uh, security. So I'm going to position those in my uh, box just as, I, just as I mark them. And we'll finish this up and we're going to see you at the range. So be safe and God bless.